this weekend and this rally is the first opportunity that we've had to properly mark a historic date. In October, we had the 50th anniversary of the Socialist Party and its pre of the Socialist Paper and the Militant, its forerunner. <laughs> to celebrate that, you might have seen on your chairs, there's a very special offer of a 50% off the cost of a subscription. Like I said, there's a flyer on all your seats and it's only available during the Socialism Weekend. So I urge anyone who doesn't yet have an, a, a subscription to the Socialist Paper to take that up immediately. Now we're going to have the first of tonight's two keynote speakers. Peter Taff is the General Secretary of the Socialist Party and as such, he is very well known to many of you here. Over those years, decades, Peter has written many of the articles. Not centuries. Not quite centuries. Two centuries. Peter has written many of the articles, as well as very important books, that have provided understanding and explanation of the situation facing the working class in Britain and in the world, and of course, also putting forward what is needed to change the world as we need to do. The hallmark as you know, of the Socialist Party is our understanding and our confidence of the centrality of the working class in the struggle to change the conditions of the 99% who suffer under capitalism. So here, to present the ideas and perspectives of the Socialist Party, please welcome General Secretary Peter Taft. Comrade Chair and comrades, I've been to many of these rallies as the chairperson has reminded us tonight. <laughs> I've been to meetings bigger than this. Remember where we had a rally in the Albert Hall? That was too small for us. We then had to move to the Alexander Palace to an incredible meeting in 1987 where there were about 8,000, 7 to 8,000 people attending that rally. But I have to say that this rally tonight is up there in the enthusiastic approach that the comrades here have taken to all the speeches made on the platform. And I don't think we have to go very far to see an explanation for that because we are a rising force. It's been shown by the success of our sister party in Ireland, where we have three MPs at the present time. You know, you, know, you wait for a London bus for a long time, <laughs> and then three come along all at once. Isn't that, however, an indication of the tremendous position that is opening up in Ireland and also the strength of our ideas, the Committee for a Workers International. But as Sarah has pointed out, this is the 50th anniversary of the production of our paper. I've been privileged to be the editor of that paper from the beginning and now the General Secretary. We started off with a handful of brothers and sisters, 40 in total from a national point of view. We grew to become a powerful force of thousands with influence amongst millions. If you're doubtful about that, just read the speech that Mrs. Thatcher gave or drawed up, drew up, but didn't actually deliver because of the Brighton bombing. She actually said that militant tendency along with Arthur Scargo, with the enemy within. And amusingly, by the way, she referred, just in passing, because she probably had a too, ma too many whiskies at that time, <laughs> that Neil Kinnock was a stooge of Arthur Scargo. <laughs> 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 
I'll let you work that one out. <laughs> but why this hatred of us? Very simple. Because militant us, we beat her. Not once, but twice. It wasn't Neil Kinnock. It wasn't the national trade union leaders. It wasn't small groups, SWP or what have you. It was militant, together with a mighty army of non-poll taxpayers. <laughs> that brought Thatcher to her knees. And that was done in the same way as the comrades in Ireland are now bat battling away on the uh, water ta tax. There's a marvellous article in this week's issue of The Socialist which details the battle that is unfolding there. It was the same in Liverpool. We have the immortal or representatives of the immortal 47 councillors, Tony Mulhern, Harry Smith, Paul, who are in this hall this evening. And they created a monument, if you like, to socialism in the houses, in the jobs, in the gains of the Liverpool working class that they, they accomplished during that battle. Now, you know, in the last week or so, we've heard that a few people on the fringes of the movement, it's true, are accusing us, that is the Socialist Party and Sharma, because of what we did in Liverpool and the colossal campaign and the achievements of 15 now in Seattle, that, you see, is an example of reformism. <coughs> we plead guilty yeah. in getting reforms for the working class. Sharma is a, a, of an heroic proportions in the US because of what we've achieved in relation to $15 now. That victory has resonated throughout the US and throughout the world. The same, by the way, applies to the poll tax struggle. In that case, we fought and defeated a vicious counter reform. We were not involved in parlor games. We took on the executive committee of the ruling class, the government in Britain. Over a hundred were jailed. 34 of those comrades were members of the militant and members of this organization. It demonstrated not in theory, but in the living reality of the experiences of the working class of what could be accomplished if you build a determined leadership that's prepared to go to the end. And that is the same in relation to Ireland. It's a privilege to have Joe Higgins here sitting in the audience, unfortunately, to have him here at this conference with the achievements of him and our comrades in Ireland. Our small organization connected with a larger organization of the anti-poll tax struggle. And that in turn connected with tens of thousands of workers which influenced millions that brought Mrs. Thatcher to her knees. That's what we achieved. And why were we able to be successful? Because there's periods in history when capitalism is going ahead, when it's possible for a determined leadership to extract reforms. This hasn't always been the case. When I became active in the labor movement, some reforms were implemented by the power of the working class. But the essence of this situation in an organic crisis of capitalism is you cannot maintain what you've built, never mind going on to further conquest, unless you're prepared to confront the system itself. This, in other words, the reforms that we gain is a byproduct of determined militant struggle. By the way, historically, there's not one major reform that the British working class haven't gained unless they threatened the very rule of capitalism itself. If you look at Miliband and Bulls, they openly put forward a counter-reformist position. 
They don't even pretend to stand for improving or defending the living standards of the working class. And it's reached ludicrous proportions in the comments in the so-called Labour press. This was an article that was in the New Statesman yesterday. A learned debate opened up. What is the future for the Labour Party? And this is what the main article said about the position in the Labour Party. It's a battle between a shit Labour Party and a shit Conservative Party. <laughs> the winner will be the one that's a little bit less shit than the other. <laughs> We couldn't have put it better. But that's from a Labour front bencher, by the way. That's from a man who will occupy one of the powers in a national government if Labour manages to get back into power. This is not even the 1970s. This is a crisis. You don't need really to spell it out in great detail. This is a period when the working class will be ground into the ground, as Mark pointed out, unless we are prepared to fight. But in order to fight, you have to have a program, you have to have a perspective, and you have to win the support of working people. Look at the position that exists in Britain that the comrade commented on in relation to the minimum wage. If the minimum wage had increased at the same right, right, rate as the bosses pay, it would now be worth 19 pounds an hour. Isn't that a terrible condemnation of those right-wing trade union leaders, the pretend trade union leaders that have allowed this situation to develop? <laughs> and let's be clear about this. The enemy class is clear about what the position is in society. Warren Buffett, who was once the richest man in the world, I think he's the second richest man at the moment, when the issue of class warfare came up, he said, there is a class warfare all right, but it's my class, the rich, that's making the war, and we are winning. Engrave that on all of your consciousness and be determined that we fashion a movement that can defeat not only this uh, Buffett, but defeat the system that produces this situation. Inequality is the big issue in the US and here that everybody is talking about at the present time. But inequality is woven into the very fabric of capitalist society. It's contained in that act where the, co the capitalist exploits the working class. And what does he gain from that? He gets in his profit unpaid labor. And the capitalists will go to the ends in order to defend their profits. George Osborne is correctly seen as a representative of the cold cruelty of the British ruling class. He was booed at the Olympics, and rightly so. But nevertheless, that's the reality of capitalist society today. Karl Marx once said that the capitalist is a rational miser. That means he accumulates wealth and his job really should take some of that to plough back into production, to develop industry and develop jobs for working people. But at this moment in time, any profit that they make is going back into the bank. If you take the figures in America alone, something like $5 trillion are piled up in what they call cash piles, not invested back into industry. That's one third almost of the gross domestic product of the US. Capitalism is failing. What we have at the moment, according to the experts, in the whole of world capitalism, Britain and America, appears to be doing better than anyone else. Well, tell the audience here tonight that that's the case. Tell the working class that that's the case. What we have is a joyless and a jobless recovery that hasn't benefited benefit working people very much. The same situation in the US. That's why Obama failed in the midterm elections. When the Republicans didn't score a huge victory, as a matter of fact, most young people and even workers 
abstain. They didn't vote in the elections. Why should they? When your young blacks are shot down in Ferguson, and we've intervened in Ferguson, our black and white comrades in America in that battle, why should the black and the people of color turn out for Obama when he's turned back and deported more immigrants than all previous presidents put together? That is not an alternative. <laughs> the situation in world capitalism today is so bad that the German bankers, that's the Bundesbank, is urging trade unionists to go on strike. To actually get an increase in wages, they save about 3%. When is the last time you've seen bankers being prepared to support a picket line. Why are they doing this? Because capitalism is in a blind alley. And they are part of the ruling class that sees they have to stimulate production. But that's individuals. The capitalist class as a whole are prepared to batten down the hatches and to continue with their, continue with their austerity program. I agree with Brian's contribution here tonight. The significance of what happened in Scotland cannot be overestimated. That was an uprising of the working class. It was a solid working class proletarian expression of a revolt against the conditions of austerity which had been stoked up and had nowhere to go. And a marvellous role was played by our sister organisation in Scotland itself. We supported the referendum. We don't support capitalist nationalization. We fight for the unity of the working class, but we support the legitimate national aspirations of the peoples of Scotland itself. Comrades, one of the things that's come out of the Scottish referendum is the absolute catastrophe of the Labour Party. Even people who fought us over decades and said, no, there's life still in the Labour Party, have now rapidly changed their position without admitting it and saying, well, the Labour Party is finished in Scotland. It's not just finished in Scotland, it's finished in England and Wales as well. As Mark pointed out, new elections will not enter the situation one iota. If it's a Tory government, in whatever disguise, with the Lib Dems participating or not, it won't make a slight difference to the lives of working people. 70% of the cuts that were designed a couple of years ago are still to be carried out. What a battle we have, merely to defend what we have, never mind going on to new con con conquests. If Miliband sneaks in, he's unlikely to challenge the status quo. Those younger members of the Parliamentary Labour Party are hoping for a Labour defeat. They've actually got a position of revolutionary defeatism as far as the Labour Party are concerned. Why? Because they don't want to inherit the mess that exists at the present time. They are afraid of power. A Labour government will be a disaster, which will mean the end of Labour. Look at the position at the last Labour Party conference when Bowles was booed at a Labour Party conference because he said openly, as Marx pointed out, they're going to raise the retirement age even more. Because he also said they're going to attack the youth, and that is criminal, by the way. And they're going to attack the, the, the benefits of the poor and so on. What reason is there for, Labour vo for people voting Labour, apart from to keep, keeping out the Tories and hoping against hope that something will turn up in the future. When Lenny McCluskey a couple of months ago warned that if this goes on, the members of this union are preparing to break with Labour, and he said openly are looking towards a new workers' party. And he said this could happen after the election. We say to Lenny publicly here, as we said to him when we discussed in his office, that's too long, Lenny. The working class are looking for an alternative now. Why not join the rest of Europe and the world? Look at what happened in Spain with the formation of Podemos. Out of nothing, if I'm not mistaken, earlier this year, 
to about 1.2 million in the Euro elections. And now, in a matter of months, is the largest party in the polls in Spain at the present time. If something like this was created in Britain, in my opinion, it would not immediately, because of the different electoral system, but over time it would gain the ear and the support of working people itself. That's why Tusk is the future of the labor movement. The decision to stand a thousand candidates in the elections and a hundred parliamentary candidates that will give us an electoral broadcast, that's a bold move. That's a, an enormous step forward. Do we expect that we'll get legions of votes? No, because it'll take time to build up the confidence of working people. But when do you start? When they're coming for us with the lorries to take us away? Because that is the situation that could develop in the not too distant future in, this, in the France, for instance, where it's possible that Marine Le Pen will beat any candidate from the left if there was a general election. By the way, that would trigger off a movement of the French working class similar to 1934 that would try and bar the way. What kind of society are we living in? When last week the Guardian said paupers' funerals were on the increase. When in the city of Sunderland you can't even find a pawn shop because the people are so poor they can't even go to a pawn shop itself. Frederick Engels said in the 19th century when the capitalists were forced to step in and take over ruined industries, he said this is the invading socialist revolution. There's not one major firm in Britain in the technology sector that does not benefit from the help of the state. This is not private enterprise. This is propped up by the cash from us, from the state, and so on. And now they are threatening to inflict even greater privations. The time has come when we have to say clearly, capitalism has had its day. It played a progressive role when it was able to develop the means of production. That no longer is the case. The only way forward is on the basis of a socialist democratic plan of production. We have an article in the current issue of socialism today. And what we say in effect, look at all the enormous capacity that has developed through the genius of working people in the technology that now is at hand. It could abolish want and privation and give us a human existence really for the first time. But capitalism will never do that because what stands in the way is private ownership and the nation state. It's only possible if the working class takes power, reorganizes society, and organizes a democratic plan of production. I'll end in a way on this theme. I mentioned about Thatcher in the beginning. Why does Marx Evoca get such hostility from the press? Why did Bob, Bob uh, Crow generate so much hostility? And he will get the same no doubt, in pressing for the minimum wage. Because they know that these are people who are fighting seriously against the system. You know, the ruling class is schooled in its universities and its schools. It's schooled in, in, the, in the statecraft on how to take on the working class. And what you find with Osborne and Cameron, particularly with Osborne, is they come back if they're forced to put beat a retreat like they did with the miners in 1981. They come back, they stockpile the coal, and they prepare for war. They are relentless, but we also are relentless. We represent that wing of the working class that says openly what is. We don't give a sugary coating to the realities of capitalism. You don't stand up, you don't fight back, you don't organize for a new society. These people will crush you, not once, but on a number of occasions. And that's why we say, here tonight, on this 50th anniversary, on this marvelous platform that we've, we, we've organized, we want a humane society. Also, we want to organize our own funeral, not for paupers, but for a discredited system that should step off the scene 
of history. You are outmoded. We can achieve socialism, and it will usher in a society of solidarity, of love, of colossal possibilities both here and worldwide. Now the last point is this gen generation, typified by those in the hall, are lucky. Not that you've won the lottery or anything like that. Something much more precious. You can participate in the building of a force which will change the world. There have been periods of retreat and reaction. This is not one of them. Ireland shows that. Scotland shows that. Britain tomorrow will show that. We're going with the grain of history. Let us build a force that can lay the basis for a socialist world. Thank you.